London lay in ruins, completely annihilated by screaming ballistic death from above. The Nazis regained control over France as the Russians and Americans run in terror, all thanks to an unimaginably powerful weapon, the V3 supergun, the Nazi dream cannon designed to bring the rest of the world to its knees. But why didn't this dream ever become a reality? There are plenty of words you could use to describe Germany's actions during World War II, but one that isn't stated enough is desperate. Even before the start of the conflict, Adolf Hitler's platform was founded on desperation, as the Führer exploited the feelings of economic disenfranchisement among the German people to garner political power. In this way, the pretense for each and every atrocity committed by the Nazi party was accompanied by a plea of desperation. No matter how powerful or sadistic their political movement became, in their innermost circles they were always the victims of some conspiracy that justified the attempt at world conquest. At least that was their justification for the heinous things they did. With this in mind, you can imagine the sort of fantastical solutions that the leadership of the German war machine would dream up when they realized the tide was turning against them. Allied efforts first started to threaten the Third Reich in the year 1943, which began with German forces floundering on the Eastern Front as the Soviet military's industrial complex increasingly outproduced the German war economy. This directly led to the historic German surrender at Stalingrad, after which the Allies began to quickly gain momentum snatching victory from famed commander Erwin Desert Fox Rommel in the North African campaign and launching a combined invasion of Benito Mussolini's Italy, which would directly lead to Il Duce's surrender. The Axis powers in Europe were being overwhelmed on all sides, and with his next closest ally, the Empire of Japan, essentially fighting an entirely separate war, Adolf Hitler had to shoot for the moon if he wanted to shift the conflict back into his favor. If the Allies now had greater numbers and superior tactics, the only solution was to utilize a weapon of such unprecedented power that it neutralized all the opposing side's advantages. To use a pop culture metaphor, Germany needed its equivalent of the Death Star from Star Wars, a great big gun with the capacity to remove an entire adversarial nation from the equation in one decisive blast. It was a long shot, literally, but since many of the best and more rational scientists in Germany had fled to other countries, those that remained were simply too loyal to the party. As a result, rationality was thrown out of the window, and their blind faith in their leader fueled the attempt to at least try to make the Führer's crazy idea a reality. And thus, German forces in occupied France set out to make a well-after-their-time concept of science fiction into engineering fact. This superweapon was called the V3 Cannon the third in a series of evocative named German V-weapons, or Vergeltungswaffen. In English, the designation translates into something along the lines of weapons of vengeance or retaliatory weapons. Considering these weapons had a suggestion of self-defense built into their very name, the devastation they ended up causing would almost be comical if it wasn't so horrific. The V-1 flying bomb was one of the first cruise missiles ever used in combat, and the telltale loud buzzing noise of their engines earned these explosive projectiles the nickname Doodlebug. V-1 rockets could be launched from ramps at incredible speed, but their linear and predictable flight path, as well as the unmistakable sound they made, made them relatively easy for the Allies to shoot down. These crippling weaknesses were fixed with the V-2 rocket, a rocket-fuel-powered, guided ballistic missile that struck at supersonic speeds with no audible indication of its approach. Vengeance Weapon 2 was so effective at hitting targets, the Allies gave up on trying to develop countermeasures to the rocket and instead focused on seizing German missile launch sites to prevent them from being fired at all. The V-2 also made history by being the first man-made object to cross over the Karman line and enter outer space as part of a vertical launch. Both the V-1 and V-2 were notoriously used against the United Kingdom to retaliate against devastating bombing runs performed by the Allies. The V-3 cannon was intended to go a step further. It was designed to completely obliterate London once its payload of rapid-fire bombs was discharged. This was the supergun's only intended target, as it would be constructed with all of its barrels pointed westward toward London. It was quite the gambit on the Führer's end. A humongous expenditure of resources, all for the sake of a weapon that could only be used against a single city. For most of the V-3 cannon's construction, the Allies didn't know what to make of this French site that seemed to be absolutely leeching German resources. The lack of information coming out of the place made all of Hitler's enemies fearful of what might lay in store. Little did they know, the V-3 cannon wasn't doing much more for the German war effort than being a hole where money fell into. Weapons like it would have only become cumbersome and expense if multiple had been made. Of course, V-3 cannons pointed at Moscow 
or even more impossibly at the eastern coast of the United States, were a far cry from what could have been economically or physically possible, but none of the party members under Hitler's command would admit it, because if they did, they'd likely be executed for treason. The concept wasn't even outside the bounds of German national psychology, as during World War I they used enormous so-called Paris guns to intimidate the French from a distance. Such weapons did very little damage for their size, but were feared nonetheless. Given the success of the other V-weapons, the V-3 cannon might have followed the same trajectory. Was it impractical? Probably. Desperate? Certainly. Cool? Kinda? But would this standing artifact of the hubris of Nazi Germany truly be seen as a joke if it had wiped London off the face of the earth? The answer is thankfully hypothetical, as like many of Germany's most harebrained concepts for superweapons, the V-3 was never deployed to the relief of the already battered population of London. However, the daunting process of its construction was still a cause of mass death in its own right. Every one of the feared V-weapons was built with the backbreaking labor of tens of thousands of enslaved Europeans. It has been documented that more lives were lost during the manufacturing process of V-2 rockets than the deployment of the missile ended up causing. Given that the V-2 was the most cost-efficient of the German Vergeltungswaffen, this implies that the number of slaves who died working on the V-1 and V-3 must have been even more staggering. Before the parts of the supergun could even be put in place, two large bunkers had to be excavated in the northern region of France. The enslaved laborers were forced to complete a monumentally grueling task, carving out the foundations for those bunkers into a chalk hill with nothing but their bare hands. It's hard to fathom the moral gravity of having several million tons of rock moved by the hands of underfed and terrified workers. It was an effort made even crueler by the fruits of their stolen labor being a weapon that could potentially bring the forces trying to liberate them to their knees. As one might expect from such an ambitious and hurried project, the technology and theory behind the V3 cannon was a bit dubious. Multiple charges of hot gas were meant to be used during the firing process to accelerate the projectiles beyond the limits of an ordinary gun of this size. In the 1800s, a pair of inventors from the US had attempted multiple prototypes of this sort of accelerating gun, all of which proved to be failures. There was another attempt made by Louis Guillaume Perrault, a French engineer who went on to invent the motorcycle, though this did not function as intended either. A persisting flaw in the multi-charge design was in the proximity of each additional charge to the previous one. Should the flash of the first charge set off the others before the projectile reached the right part of the barrel, the additional kinetic energy would be wasted instead of increasing the speed. Because of this, multi-charge weapons remained obscure until French engineers tried to create their own as a response to German artillery during World War I. These plans eventually served as the basis for the V3, the development of which was spearheaded by the inventor of the rockling shell, August Conders. Conders had a few proposed adjustments that he believed could make the once abandoned technology viable such as elongating the barrel to leave more space between charges, as well as adopting localized electrical charges to avoid the problem of premature ignition. While the testing of the V3 cannons was limited, the reported results were promising. Hitler gave the project approval to move ahead without further tests in August of 1943, after the Allies succeeded in forcing Italy to surrender. The German engineering team promised a firing rate that could level all of London in a matter of hours delivering one bomb per minute from a distance of over 100 miles away. Almost unsurprisingly, the actual speed of the projectiles and the gun's rate of fire were nowhere near what was expected of the weapon, but with Allied intelligence learning of the V3 cannon's existence, it was starting to become a make-or-break moment for the Axis. Germany had attempted to disguise the true purpose of the installation site by referring to the cannon by the codename Hochdrunk Pumpe, German for high-pressure pump. The design also received other less custodial sounding nicknames such as Millipede and Busy Lizzie, but no amount of subterfuge could keep such a grand military endeavor under wraps, especially since retaking France was now one of the primary objectives of the Allies. An American initiative to destroy the supergun was now underway, starting with an attempt to bombard the bunkers that housed the weapon using an unmanned aircraft. This 1944 mission, codenamed Project Anvil, can be considered one of the earliest iterations of the principles behind a drone strike though the drone itself was unfortunately not able to complete its assigned task. In order to get close enough to deliver the payload of 21,000 pounds of explosives, the heavy bomber was piloted close to its target before being abandoned by parachute and making the rest of the journey without human assistance. One of the two pilots chosen for the important mission was Joe Patrick Kennedy Jr., the elder brother of the future president John F. Kennedy. Joe Kennedy was a decorated officer in the U.S. Navy, but after proving his aptitude in aerial missions as both a combatant and a leader, 
His superiors thought him to be the best fit for this top secret mission that would all but cement him as a great American war hero. Since nothing bad ever happens to Kennedys, Joe accepted this chance to prove himself and hopped aboard the B-24 Liberator that had been specifically prepared for him. While en route to the V-3 cannon site at Mimoyac, France, an unforeseen tragedy claimed both his life and the life of his co-pilot, Lt. Wilfred John Willey, resulting in the aircraft exploding only 20 minutes after takeoff. The blast was so sudden and violent that neither pilot's bodies were recovered. Several decades later, the tragic explosion was found to be the result of an electromagnetic glitch that caused the bomb detonators to overheat. While the Allies sought to regroup and find another way to destroy the cannon, the bittersweet truth was that the V-3 had already been neutralized earlier that summer as a result of an entirely different bombing raid on German-occupied France by the British. The bunkers had also been damaged due to earthquakes, so the yet-to-be-fired V-weapon was abandoned by the German forces. As a result, it's the only one of the Vergeltungswaffen that neither saw true completion or usage. Variants of the V-3 design were later used to assault Luxembourg, but history shows that multi-charge guns were not the game-changers Germany was hoping for. Even if the weapon site had not been destroyed by the Allies, the many issues that plagued the project since its proposal would have likely hampered any opportunity to wield the supergun effectively enough to win the war. One documentary about the V-3 shows that when analyzing the remains of the installation, there was no proof that electrical transmitters were even used, indicating that most of August Condor's suggestions were acknowledged by the German military, but for some inexplicable reason, never put into practice. Because of this, premature ignition was likely still a recurring handicap to the weapon, mostly due to the use of gas-powered charges, similar to the designs of the late 1800s, rather than the initially proposed electrical transmitters. On top of that major setback, there seemed to be a lot of indecision and confusion surrounding the exact shape of the ammunition that would be placed into the V-3. The design puzzle of building a bomb that was aerodynamic enough to make use of the supersonic speed that the multi-charge process would grant it was something that the remaining German engineers struggled with for as long as the V-weapon was being developed. Perhaps if Germany had retained more of the brilliant scientific minds that its brutal regime had driven out, these prevalent setbacks could have been overcome. Even then, the principle behind the V-3, a weapon designed for crushing an entire city and breaking the morale of an enemy nation, was brought to bear in the later creation of the nuclear warhead. As Germany was defeated, perhaps the 20th century's greatest superweapon was dropped on Japan. If there was ever a moment that signaled the obsolescence of the V-3 cannon, that was it then and there. The real-life Death Star had come to be, and it was utilized to devastating and terrible effect by the side that claimed victory in World War II. For all of the flashiness and formidable potential that Adolf Hitler saw in the V-3 cannon, it was nothing more than an ignorant premonition of what warfare would become. In much the same way that science fiction authors have speculated about the cutting-edge tech of our future and find themselves proven right in ways they could not have expected, the individuals behind the Vergeltungswaffen could have only dreamed that their vision of desolation could be made manifest. While it's now indisputable that Adolf Hitler would have needed a lot more than a perfectly functional V-3 cannon to defeat the Allies and conquer the world, the uneasy existence of such a monstrous weapon is a testament to everything that was equally incompetent and merciless about the Nazi regime. For more on Hitler's crazy superweapons, check out Hitler's superweapons that terrified the world, or watch this video instead.